G'day lads, if you're a university student then at some point during your degree you'll need to use Microsoft Excel and having spent plenty of time in Excel myself there are five main skills that I've found that have helped me get 100% in every Excel assignment I've ever done. And of course everybody if you wanted to follow along with the examples in this video then click the first link in the description to download the Excel file and check out all the other sports models I have on the Excel Lads Patreon. Now lads, there are plenty of useful Excel functions. For assignments, you'll end up using functions like sum, average, and count, but all of these are very easy to use and well known. In my experience, the biggest problem people have with Excel is looking up and returning a value. Let's look at this table of the 10 fastest sprinters of 2024 and their best times for the last three years. Suppose I wanted to look up an athlete and return their 2024 season's best, with the data set this more, you could just locate your athlete, for example, Noah Lyles or Fred Curley, and then go straight across to their time. However, that's a very inefficient method when dealing with much larger data sets such as my UFC model, which is over 3,000 rows of data. Without a lookup function, it's just impractical. So lads, if you want to return Christian Coleman's season's best, I'll enter his name into cell C14 here and use an X lookup function in C15 to get his time. In an XLOOKUP function, there are three main arguments. Firstly, the lookup value, Christian Coleman in cell C14. Then the lookup array, where in the range B3 to B12, we want to find our lookup value, Christian Coleman. And finally, the return array, where we are matching the lookup value to the return array in cells G3 to G12. As a result, Coleman's best time in 2024 is 9.86. The best thing about this formula, lads, is if I change the lookup value to Noah Lyles, the formula will return Noah's time of 9.79 seconds. Along with the athlete, I can also make the year a parameter. To return Lyles' best time in 2022, I'll have to use a very popular index match formula, and in the index function, my array will be the range of times for each athlete and year in cells D3 to G12. To return the time for the row Lyles is on, I can use the match function to identify Noah's row number, so here I can look up Noah Lyles in cell C14 and get an exact match in cells B3 to B12. I can also do the same thing for the column number required in the index function. I can match the year selected in C15 to the years in D2 to G2. And now that I've gotten the correct row and column numbers, when I press enter, it returns the time for Lyles in 2022. Of course, whenever I change the year or athlete, the time updates. To make the selection process even simpler, I can use Excel's data validation feature to make a drop down list for the sprinter and the year. So after selecting Kashane Thompson, go into the data tab and select the data validation icon. I'll allow a list and the source for that list will be the athletes in the range B3 to B12. After you press OK, you'll be able to select an athlete in cell C14 from the drop down list and I can do the same thing for the year and this time I'll select the years in D2 to G2 as the source for the list. Using these two lists, I can easily see the time for any athlete in any year, such as Fred Curley in 2021. Another skill you'll need, lads, is the ability to analyse data and answer research questions with statistical tests. In the past, I've had to use a t-test to determine whether there is a home advantage for EPL sides, linear regression to predict goals based on possession stats, and logistic regression to forecast UFC fights. In this example, I've got a CSV data set called MT Cars, which I've just copied into A1. And after I've cleaned the data up, I'll investigate whether there is a significant difference between the miles per gallon, MPG, between manual and automatic cars. To clean this CSV data into something I can analyse, I'll go into the data tab and select the text to columns icon. Using the comma as the delimiter, I can press finish and the data will be transformed. I'll format the data nicely, then delete the columns that aren't necessary for this analysis. Basically, I'll delete every column except for the car type, MPG and the AM column, which indicates whether the vehicle is automatic or manual with a 0 or 1 respectively. However, the 0 or 1 AM column can represent the data set more clearly by being changed to the text automatic or manual. So I'll create a new column named transmission to the right and use an if function to return the text manual if the AM column shows a 1 and automatic otherwise. After filling the formula down to row 33, I'll paste only the values over the top and delete the AM to replace it with the text version. Finally, to make the data set even easier to analyze, I can sort each car by alphabetical order in the transmission column. 
that'll split the range into all the automatic cars first with all the manual cars grouped below. You can do this quickly using the sort feature in the data tab. Now we can analyze the two groups of data using Excel's analysis tool pack add-in. On my Mac it's located in the tools menu under Excel add-ins where you can enable the analysis tool pack and solver add-in by checking the box and clicking OK. Once enabled it appears under the data tab as data analysis. First I'll run some fairly basic analysis of the difference between the automatic and manual cars. In data analysis I'll select the descriptive statistics option. For the input range I'll select the miles per gallon of all the automatic cars. Then I'll set the output to appear in cell F2 and finally I'll make sure that the summary statistics checkbox is selected. This will produce all the main summary statistics for the automatic cars including the mean and sample variance which is important for answering our research question. I can do the same thing for the manual cars now and all I have to do here is change the input range. Now I can compare the two groups and straight away it's evident that the average miles per gallon is different for automatic and manual cars. That is, manual cars have a higher average MPG than automatic cars. However, I don't yet know if that difference is significant. As the descriptive statistics also show that the equality of variance assumption is inappropriate, I can go into data analysis to run a two sample t-test assuming unequal variances. After selecting the two input ranges for automatic and manual cars, I want to run the test to analyze whether the true difference between the two groups is zero at a significance level of 5%. Once the test has been run, the average miles per gallon is compared and as the two-tailed p-value in cell N13 is less than the significance level of 5%, we can conclude that there is a significant difference between the efficiency of automatic and manual cars in the MT cars data set to the left, and we can also conclude that the efficiency of manual cars is higher than that of automatic cars. Next lads, being able to make a nice table and pivot table is important for managing and visualizing data. In this example, I've got a data set named Iris, which contains three different species of flowers and their petal and sepal width and length. To make it a table, select any cell in the range and use the shortcut Control or Command T. The great thing about tables is that they are dynamic, so adding a new row or column to the data set will automatically be included in the table. Also, each table has the ability to sort and filter its data. For example, I can sort every flower's sepal length in descending order. To the right of the data set, I'll use an IF function to create a new column named SIZE and describe each flower with a petal width greater than 1.5 as large and if not, they'll be labeled as small. Excel's flash fill feature will usually fill this formula for all the applicable rows below, and now I'm able to filter the table by small flowers. However, if I wanna analyze the data in this table better, I can build a pivot table. To do that, I have a cell in the table selected, go to the insert tab and select the pivot table icon to create a new worksheet. To build a report on the left, a space for the field list will appear on the right, and here I can drag and drop the species field for my row values. In this pivot table for each species, I want to return the number of flowers and the average sepal length. To return the count of each species, I can bring the row names field into the values area. Automatically though, the pivot table returns the sum. To change the aggregation to a count, I can either select the little information icon on the row, or I can right click and select the field settings option and change it to count. This updates the pivot table to show that each species has exactly 50 items in the iris data set. Next, I can create a column for the average sepal length by species in the pivot table through adding the sepal length option to the values area. Again, I'll have to change the field settings and switch it from sum to average. And lads, now that I've got the pivot table I wanted, to make things a bit more interesting, I'll add a filter. To do this, I'll drag the size field into the filter area and this will create a section at the top of the worksheet where I can select to filter the pivot table by small or large values. After I select cell B1, I can filter by only large flowers, which will update the pivot table. And of course, on the other hand, I can also filter by small flowers. Next, lads, we're going to visualize the data in the pivot table using a couple of graphs and charts. And I think the main advantage of visualizing data in Excel is how easy it is. With that being said, after selecting any cell in the pivot table range, all you have to do is go to the insert tab and select the graph you'd like. For example, I'll start with a simple pie chart displaying the share of small flowers by species. 
I can name this graph and if I really wanted to change the colors, axes and appearance of the chart. I can also create a clustered bar chart of the data which will compare the count and the average sepal length of each small flower by species. With the pivot table the charts are dynamic so if I change the filter to include large flowers the graphs will update automatically. These are just two quick examples but there are many different graphs you can also create very quickly with Excel. Finally, dynamic arrays introduced to Excel in 2020 are by far my favorite feature of Excel. They allow formulas to spill automatically into adjacent cells, update automatically and eliminate the need for manual adjustments. In this example, which you might find in a finance assignment, I've got to create a formula to accumulate $500 for a term of 10 years at a rate of 10% per annum. So that I'm able to change the parameters, I'll use array formulas to visualize the accumulation over the term dynamically. In B7, I'll use the array function called sequence to spill C3 plus one rows, starting at zero and increasing by one. This spills 10 rows from zero to 10. And for example, when I change the term to five years, the array will update and spill five years instead. For the accumulated amount in C7, I'll multiply the amount by one plus the interest rate and raise it to the power of the array in B7. By putting the hash symbol beside B7, I'll reference the entire dynamic array, allowing the formula to calculate the accumulated amount for each year in the sequence. This means as the array in B7 updates from changing the term length, the accumulated amounts beginning in C7 will automatically adjust. Now, of course, lads, if I change any of the parameters above the amount, max term or interest rate, then the dynamic arrays in columns B and C will update. So I can change the amount to $1,000, the max term to 15 years and the interest rate to 7.4% and the accumulated amount corresponding to the year will spill below. Now to make this dynamic array look even better, I can apply some conditional formatting. So I'll change the max term back to 10. I'll select B7 through to C1 million, basically all the way down to the bottom of the worksheet and then I'll go into conditional formatting in the home tab, select new rule, and in here for the style, I'll select classic. And in here, I'll use a formula to determine which cells to format. That formula will be equals, then an if function, if the length of open bracket, dollar sign B7, closer bracket is more than zero, that is there's a text or number there, then return an if function, whereby if the mod function or modulus of the row comma two closer bracket is equal to zero return true if not return false closer bracket and return false otherwise closer bracket there and before i press ok i'll come up with a specialized formatting i'll go into the border and add a bottom and top border and for the fill i'll put a background color of gray so when I press OK, I can have a preview of what the formatting looks like. And this will color every second row in the array in gray. So no matter how big the array is, it'll look like this. And of course, I can change the color and the sequence or pattern of the stripes there. If I change the max term, then the year and accumulated amount will, of course, update along with the conditional formatting. Thanks for watching lads. If you like this video, then make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you're interested, click the first link in the description below to go to the Excel Lads Patreon.